Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. We're going to have quite a show today, and and my guess you'll you'll understand what I'm talking about. But you know what? I think the direction we're going to be going at this point in time. We got so many issues that we're faced with uh, here, uh, not only in the in the country but in the state of Oregon, and just even with your own local community aspect of it. And you know how do you how do you pick all this stuff up and and understand it? We got the whole issue about the marijuana issue. You know, the state of Washington now has uh, pretty well have already have, uh, adopted the marijuana issue. Folks are so confused over there. They don't know whether or not they're smoking pot or not. When to, when to smoke, when not to smoke, that's an issue. We got the state of Oregon, maybe led by uh, 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 Congressman Earl Blumenauer, basically trying to figure out what he's going to do with the marijuana. You know, I, I, I don't want to get so facetious and funny about this. What, I mean, where, where does he come off? You know, he's in the district, you know, that we have all sorts of issues and whatever. But, you know, here we are. Uh, maybe looking at the possibility of putting marijuana here, the same same situation that we're having in Washington, maybe f competing for the dollars. Is that what we want to do? Well, we need to talk about those issues. Then we got the whole issue with PERS, you know. I mean, that's a major, 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 major issue. As you know, I made a statement a couple of shows ago from the standpoint, there's no there's no solution to this problem at this point in time because the people, most of the people who are, are basically concerned making the decision on the whole issue of PERS, they're all on PERS. And it's going to be pretty tough for persons who basically have built up their retirement and their standard of living, if you will, on their existing dollars coming in to all of a sudden say, no, we want a reduction. It just, it just don't work there. We're going to have to come up with something. My position was right off the bat. We need to take it to the people. Pick it to the people. Let's have a vote on this issue. Not basically asking the people who are receiving the prayers to come up with a solution. They won't do it. Then there's the, there's, there's the issue with the whole issue of abortion. There's, uh, there's the issue on the gay marriage aspect of it. The, 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 was it uh, DOMA, the defense of, on marriage, uh, if you will. We went through the Supreme Court's going in. They're sort of locked. They don't know where to, where to go with this situation. I mean, we've got some issues. We've got some major issues. Whether you like it or you don't like it, we're going to have to solve the problem. We've got to talk about it. And I think it is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And I would say 90% of us in the population right now, 90% of us, really don't know where to go. We're bombarded with media daily, whether it be talk radio, whether it be TV, whether it be the newspaper, whatever. We're just all messed up. Well, anyway. I'm going to just sort of, we're going to start a series here, and I'm going to take some of those issues, and we're just going to have a discussion on each one of them. And, uh, and then I'm going to open up the line if necessary, and if, if we don't open up the line uh, during the, the first hour, uh, we'll just follow up with, a, with another show and open up the line and give you an opportunity to express your opinion. So it, it's about being open-minded enough to say, well, okay, fine, it's not you're for it or you're against it. It's, let's have a discussion to kind of get a sense of the origin and so therefore, now we can have an intelligent discussion. What impact is this having on you, the individual, you, the voter, you know, you, you, the breadwinner, the whole nine yards? But what we're going to do, we're going to start off today with, uh, with a subject, with an area that uh, we're all sort of like in, in concerned about. It's the whole issue of gay marriage and the whole issue of gay rights and uh, defense of marriage. Act. I mean, all that whole piece. So. I've, I've picked. A, I've got a guy here with us today who I've known. Who's he's been on on the Oregon Voters Digest talking on several other subject matters that we've had before, but in this particular case, I, I, he's been involved and in in, um, in 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 this particular issue. He's pretty well gotten the facts, and I've I've always felt very strongly about the fact when I made a statement about the definition of uh, someone with a legal background is that they've got the dictionary. <laughs> and my friend here is Herbert Gray. He's an attorney at law here in the Portland metropolitan area. He's practices law, and he just so happened to be a, a, be, a, be affiliated, if you will, with uh, with, um, with the Alliance for Defending Freedom. And one of the areas that he's basically done some research in is the whole issue of this this uh, this gay rights stuff and the, and the marriage stuff and this that and the other. So I think it would be very very informative. And uh, again, like I said. Uh, I hope you have an open minded about this situation. Listen, and then, and then, like I said, I will give you an opportunity to respond uh, to uh, whatever's being said here at this point in time. But, but, but initially, I would like for for to have a discussion here with with uh, with Attorney Gray and uh, about this issue, about the whole issue about uh, uh, gay marriage and this, that, and the other. Okay. So with that, Herb, welcome. 
Great to be here. It's been Bruce. a while, but I'm glad to see you. Good okay. to see you. Sure enough, sure enough. Well, look, there, there are several uh, uh, topic heads that uh, we put together here that we will probably maybe go through, and then hopefully you'll get you'll respond accordingly. Sure. I think that uh, why don't we start off from the standpoint of the importance of traditional marriage? I mean, let's let's go, let's go on with where we where we were at one point in time, and now we've gotten to this situation. So I've got several different categories. And we're gonna sure. Do. Okay. Well. The, I think it's important for everybody to understand that what we consider traditional marriage has been around for a long, long time, not just in our culture, but in a lot of cultures over the last several thousand years, across all kinds of religious traditions. And why is that? Well, it's because it still takes a man and a woman to make a baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And men and women bring different things to the table when it comes to not only creating children, but also raising children and nurturing children and instructing children. And what makes marriage so important as a building block of our society is the recognition that men and women are unique. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that intuitively, that men and women are unique, and they bring different things to the table. Mm -hmm. So if it takes a man and a woman to create a child, and kids do better if they have a mom and a dad, mm -hmm. which I think we would all acknowledge, mm -hmm then it makes perfect sense that marriage exists to create a good environment for raising kids and helping get those kids pointed in the right direction and raised up so they do not become a drain on society, ending up on welfare, being uneducated, um, not having jobs, uh, ending up below, below the poverty level and on welfare and so on. And that is why marriage has always been so important. And it's not just in our culture, it's been in all kinds of cultures. So, so let, 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 let me ask the question then from the standpoint. So, so what's the motivation that we've given to a person getting married? What's the motivation for doing that? Well, what's I think... Of, what's some of the perks, if you will? The, the thing is that there, you, you, we have to look at marriage in terms of the public and private interests that it okay. serves. All right. We also have to think of it in terms of the benefits that come with it right, right, because exactly. there are certain benefits exactly. and okay. some of them are given by the government and some are not. Let's talk about that. But if we think about what the purposes are, okay. I mean everybody kind of knows that um, or thinks well you get married to somebody that you love mm -hmm. and you like other people to approve of that choice or to validate that choice in some fashion. We all like validation. Well that's important but that's not the most important thing. There's also the aspect of getting married. Um, there are legal interests that attach to that to mm -hmm. make sure that we know who is responsible for taking care of whom, mm -hmm. who is responsible for deciding how that kid is raised, um, who has the responsibility to provide support to that kid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, there are certain public interests that we all share that are really important that a lot of times get lost in this. And then, of course, for some people, there's a religious component to it. They want, you know, God's blessing or they view this as a covenant. But the whole, whichever way you come at this, the basic idea is a recognition of a relationship that is supposed to last mm -hmm. and that society recognizes certain benefits to that relationship lasting. Mm -hmm. And that's really the key to the whole thing. It's not trying to say that certain people don't deserve it or should be excluded from it or anything like that. What we're talking about is how do we as a society validate certain relationships because they do important things. And that's really the key to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, on, the, on that same note, um, I'm, 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 I'm the lay person at this point in time, <laughs> time, so I'm going to just kind of ask, the, maybe I, I'm being redundant. No. But the idea is that um, those perks and whatever, and those motivation and the enthusiasm, whatever, is what to bear children. Right. Well, and to raise children. And to raise children. Right. right. You have to raise them. Yeah. Have yeah. To naturally. Okay. Okay. So, so, again, let's spend a little bit more time from there, from the standpoint. So, the benefits, if you some of the benefits, we got the child. We're raising the child aspect of it. Right. Now, what are some of the benefits of of two people married, man? man and woman, right, mm -hmm. that the other side wouldn't have. Well, what you often problem. hear is, why shouldn't everybody be able to marry right. whoever they love? Right, okay. 
as if the most important thing is that you got to love somebody. Right. Okay. Now, yes, in a perfect world, we all want to be able to marry somebody that we love. But the the critical thing is that everybody has the same opportunity to marry somebody that they're allowed to marry. Mm -hmm. Okay. The and and we there are lots of laws that say a father can't marry his daughter or a mother can't marry her son or you can't marry your first cousin you can't marry somebody less than 16 years of age okay our society recognizes that there are certain people who are not really ready or shouldn't be allowed to be in that type of a relationship mm -hmm. for perfectly understandable reasons mm -hmm. and so if the whole conversation is about I ought to be able to marry whoever I love mm -hmm. what you're really saying is nobody has the right to tell me something different hmm. okay well, I think we would all acknowledge if we hear about some guy that wants to marry his daughter, our instinctive reaction is, ooh. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea as a starting point that, that there's no reason to regulate marriage is ridiculous on its face because there do need to be lines drawn in certain places. Um, I think it's also important for us to remember that our society depends upon certain things happening in a family. And if that doesn't happen in a family, it has to happen somewhere else and usually with public money. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. So to approach this from the standpoint that there is a fundamental inequality in the definition of marriage is ridiculous because everybody has the same opportunity to choose somebody to marry. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. There's no question about that. And anybody who is serious about this issue will understand that you don't get to marry a, on an unlimited basis whomever you want to marry. But we all have the same ground rules to work from. Mm -hmm. So how do we get to this other point on the other side? Any, any idea from a historical standpoint? How did we get to this degree? Well, I, I think a lot of times uh, there's a couple of ish reasons for that. One is the whole idea that it's all about love. Okay. 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 Well, but I'm not going to sit here and say love is a bad thing. Right. right. You wouldn't either. Right. But the, the reality is there's more to it than love. Mm -hmm. And yet that's how it's commonly mm -hmm. portrayed. Plus there's a lot of argument about whether or not people are born with some sort of homosexual tendencies or whether that they develop that. Well, there's science all over the place, but really credible studies say there is no such thing as a gay gene. People are not born that way, and there are a number of factors that lead people to make certain choices. Now, the folks who are, who are, who are pushing against traditional marriage don't want everybody thinking about the fact that people choose to engage in certain types of behavior. And yet, re in reality, that is exactly what's going on. So, <clears throat> if we get right down to talking about people choosing to do certain things and wanting the validation of society, that's really what's being pushed. And so anybody who gets in the way of that, who says, I don't think that it should be a free and open field here, is then cast um, as being bigoted or intolerant or something like that. When in reality they're saying there are good reasons for the rules that we have. And it has nothing to do with telling somebody they can't have the same opportunities. It's got everything to do with biology and sociology and good things for kids and stable families and stable governments and good citizens. Okay. Well, now, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place for this point. And with that. What about, uh, maybe, maybe you can give some examples of some pending cases maybe that, that talks to that kind of a situation Well, I, that I'm, people might be familiar with. Right. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the cases that were just argued to the Supreme Court a couple of weeks okay, ago, right. a lot of people probably do not understand right. all the exactly. ins and outs of those. Exactly. So there were two cases. There were two cases, right. Uh, the one, uh, the Perry case, which was the Proposition 8 case from California, is the better known one. Right. And what, what uh, the Prop 8 case was about, um, several years ago, the voters in California passed an initiative, it was Proposition 22, that defined marriage as between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. And there was a legal challenge to that, and it got struck down. So then there was another initiative that was voted on um, uh, in 2008, I believe it was, and 
millions and millions of Californians voted to retain the traditional definition of marriage. That was Prop 8. P this is Prop 8. Okay. Again, it's challenged, and this time it goes the way it uh, goes up through the court system. And when it got to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, Judge Reinhardt said, well, the only reason that anybody could possibly pass something like this is because they hate gay people. What? It's right in the opinion. But the people, but the people voted. The people voted, and what he's really saying is there is no other reason why people would vote for this other than they hate gay people. Well, we've already talked about the fact there are a whole bunch of social reasons and biological reasons and every governmental reasons why people would make that decision. So when the Prop 8 case comes up through the courts, basically the argument is the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause um, makes that decision of millions of California voters improper because they must just hate gay people because that's the only reason. Um, the other issue that was involved in the Perry case, um, it's important for, and most people don't know this, but it's important for people to know that the governor of California and the attorney general of California, who are obligated to defend state laws, declined to do so. So who ended up upholding or, or defending Proposition 8? the will of millions of California voters. It was the people who put Proposition 8 on the ballot. Who's the governor doing that damn, you know what I mean? Well, it was Governor Schwarzenegger when it first started. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. The Supreme Court wanted everybody to talk about whether the people who put Prop 8 on the ballot mm -hmm. right. that's, that's right. had stan legal standing to defend the, the law when the government officials who were supposed to do that constitutionally wouldn't do it. So that's what's going on with, with Proposition 8. And the Supreme Court is showing all kinds of indications that they may say, well, we're a little uncomfortable with this whole legal standing question, so we may just leave it intact because of that. Then the result is confined to California. So that's the, that's the Perry case, the Prop 8 case. The other is the Windsor case, which comes out of New York originally, and it involves the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. And the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, as many people probably have heard, was passed in 1996 by overwhelming bipartisan majorities in the House and the Senate. And President Clinton signed it. And everybody kind of understood that this was sort of a no-brainer. And it does the, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act does two things. The first thing is to say marriage is a man and, and a woman um, for purposes of all kinds of federal benefits. Mm -hmm. The second thing it does is to say no state should have to recognize anything other than the marriage of a man and a woman or, or woman if somebody got married in another state and then comes to their state. Mm -hmm. Okay? Makes sense. So very straightforward, you know, kinds of things that most people would accept as perfectly reasonable. But what's happened now is because of the, the political environment we find ourselves in, and especially with Judge Reinhardt from the Ninth Circuit saying, you know, the only reason to pass anything defending traditional marriage is because you hate gay people. Um, now there are a lot of people who formerly voted for federal, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act who are now saying, I no longer do, President Clinton included. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the things that were so reasonable and understandable to a huge bipartisan majority of both houses of Congress and the President of the United States, now everybody goes, well, maybe we didn't get that right. But nothing has really changed in terms of the underlying objectives and the importance of marriage in our society. It's all the same. Well, you know, <laughs> Again, I, I'm still asking the question, what about the vote? I mean, what about the people? I, it was supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I know one could maybe bring in the, the civil rights issues, you know what I mean? Uh, right. That, that's, that's major. And we're still discussing those issues. You, and you can, at, some, at times you can compare that, if you right. will, in many ways. You got me? But, uh, but this issue here, I mean, all of a sudden, you know, um, what, 10 years back or so? I mean, it was there, but, but it wasn't a major, major, major issue on the front line. Right, and all of a sudden now it's here on the front line with a small minority basically prom pr pr promoting this piece. Well, how did and, we get there? 
Well, the other thing that I think is important for everybody to understand yeah. is that marriage is not the end game here. Oh, really? There is a lot more going on. And uh, what's really going on is what many people refer to as the sexual autonomy agenda. Getting hmm. back to what I was saying earlier, I should be able to love and have sex with whomever I want to love and have sex with. Okay? And I want the, everybody in society to approve my choices of that. So, <clears throat> um, a lot of times you will hear from proponents of homosexual marriage that all they want is equality. Well, back in the 80s and 90s, they said all we want is equality. Well, then they got equality, and then they said now we want the benefits of marriage. And in many states, they got the benefits of marriage. So now they're saying we want marriage, and increasingly they're getting marriage. But what they're really after is not marriage equality, it is marriage extinction. And I, I have a quote hmm. that I think really captures this. Hmm. Uh, and this is a quote from a lady named Marcia Gessen, who's a journalist and um, a self-professed lesbian. She's speaking at a conference in Australia, and she says, it's a no-brainer that we should have the right to marry. But I also think equally that it's a no-brainer that the institution of marriage should not exist. Marriage equality becomes marriage elasticity with the ultimate goal of marriage extinction. Hmm. Hmm. So the people who are saying, we want marriage, and I'm not saying this is true of yeah, everybody, yeah, but yeah. a lot of the people who are pushing that conversation really are not interested in marriage, they want to do away with marriage. And why do they want to do away with marriage? Because they want everybody to validate their ability to love and have sex with whomever they want to love and have sex. And that's something that isn't talked about hmm. in general um, in the media coverage you see and so on like that. But that's what's really going on. Hmm. The other thing that's going on is that the folks who are pushing this recognize that one of the biggest forces that's opposing them are people in the church who believe in Christianity and that that means that marriage is one man and one woman. And a lot of these people say if it comes down to a conflict between what we want and religious liberty, religious liberty has to give. Now again, you don't hear about that in the media, but that's really what's going on. And there's some really prominent people, if you want to get into this, who have said that straight up. Well, you know, you, you make a good point because I've talked, and that before we did the show here, I, I talked to a number of ministers. I, I've talked to people. And when I started thinking about Prop 8, I called back to California. Mm -hmm. I got relatives down there also, too. And then all of a sudden, and I, I've talked to um, the Hispanic community in that arena, who I, I've got some good friends along that particular line. And it just, I, all of a sudden, they threw things on the table and it just dawned on me. They said, wait a minute. I was thinking about, gee, was, uh, California would be so little, so open to this thing. It would be, no, it'd be a slam dunk. But it didn't. And so you start thinking about right. it. Well, you know. When you think about Hispanics, they're very Catholic, they're very religious along that particular line, very, very family oriented, very strong. You bet. And blacks are the same way in yes. that particular area, in the African Americans, for as far as families are concerned. And so, uh, you know, then you start looking at um, the marketing of this whole piece during that particular time. They're not in there. Right. They're not in there. They're not in the group. And, 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 and they've all, and so the, uh, when I think about the equal rights aspect of it and this, that, and the other, what happened to the blacks? What happened to the Hispanics aspect of it? You got my point? Right. They were the bulk vote that basically turned down. Well, and the, in the environment we find ourselves in is anybody who opposes yeah. this agenda we're yeah. talking about yeah. is um, basically crucified. And there are very good reasons for it, and I've already kind of alluded to them, yeah. but I, I, I want to just share something with you. Yeah. And this comes out of, a, um, out of a book that was written in 1987. Okay. okay, it's uh, written. It's called "The Overhauling of Straight America" by um, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen, and this is a direct quote of what they said the agenda needs to be. And this is in 1987. 1987. Talk about gays and gayness as loudly and often as possible. 
portray gays as victims, not aggressive challengers, give homosexual protectors a just cause, just in quotes, make gays look good, make the victimizers look bad, and solicit funds get corporate America and major foundations to financially support the homosexual cause. Now, if you think about what's t transpired in our society since 1987, haven't all those things happened? Yeah. So this is not just a matter of a bunch of people who are asking for everybody to approve of their relationships. They're trying to make sure that they don't have opposition either. And so there are many people, you know, you talk about many, many parts of our society mm -hmm. that you would expect would be in favor of traditional marriage, right. and right. they exist. Right. Right. Why is it that we don't hear about that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because there are a lot of people who have kind of been cowed into silence because it's not cool to Thank say you. you're against this agenda. But we are all creatures of our exposure. I, I realize that. I mean, you know, why, I'm just why saying, can't you talk about it? I mean, this is America, right? Freedom right. of speech, right? What's the problem? Well, the problem is, again, that there is the people who are leading the charge here mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. agenda mm -hmm. don't want opposition, and they want to annihilate the opposition. And they're not after marriage. They're after the ability to have unlimited access to whomever they want to love, whenever they want to love them, for as long as they want to love them, and to have sex with whomever they want to have sex with. And no family. The leaders of the agenda, that is what they're after. And, you know, even um, back in 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court decided the Lawrence versus Texas case, where they struck down the Texas sodomy statute. And um, Justice Scalia was just fit to be tied about that. So he writes in a dissent, and this is what's really going on. Supreme Court. This is Scalia. Justice Scalia in his dissent in okay. 2003. Okay. State laws against bigamy, same-sex marriage, adult incest, prostitution, masturbation, adultery, fornication, bestiality, and obscenity are likewise sustainable only in light of Bauer's validation of laws based on moral choices. Every single one of these laws is called into question by today's decision. Now, what is he saying? If you strike down marriage, we are on the slippery slope because there is no principled way to oppose all of these things that he mentioned if you throw marriage out the window. So traditional marriage is the linchpin of all of this. And, um, you know, the challenge is to be able to say, again, that there are legitimate interests that need to be addressed that are addressed by marriage. But why aren't we having these kind of discussions? Well, again, you know, there are people who want to make anybody who opposes this, right. you know, look bad right. um, and, you know, be regarded as, you know, out, out of date and, you know, all of that. In fact, um, I just wanted to uh, to share with you, uh, this is a quote from Mark Stern of the American Jewish Congress. Okay. <clears throat> and he says... And who, where, where, Jewish Congress, where, where is that? Where, where uh, is, the American Jewish Congress so is, a, is a basically a, a, a Jewish non-discrimination organization. Okay. okay, all right. The legalization of same-sex marriage would represent the triumph of an egalitarian-based ethic over a faith-based one. The remaining question is whether the champions of tolerance are prepared to tolerate proponents of a different ethical vision. Hmm. I think the answer will be no. Now this is somebody who would ordinarily line up on the other side of the table mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. but what he's saying is, will the people pushing this agenda be content to tolerate a different point of view? In the, and he says, I don't think so. Hmm. The people I usually hang around with, I don't think will stand around and, and, and abide that. Um, and um, there's a, a law professor who just was appointed to the Equal Opportunity, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission by President Obama. Her name is Chai Feldblum. And um, this is what she said. I believe the burden on religious people that will be caused by granting gay people full equality will be justified. That is because I believe granting liberty to gay people advances a compelling government interest that such an interest cannot be adequately advanced if pockets of resistance 
to a societal statement of equality are permitted to flourish, hmm. and hence that a law that permits no individual... ...rights that states that uh, no law shall be...